This is Dr. Karen, and you are listening to the DeFacto Leaders Podcast on the Bee Podcast Network, where I share up-to-date, evidence-based practices, my own experiences, and guest interviews designed to help pediatric therapists, educators, and aspiring school leaders design services that support social, emotional, and academic growth and set kids up for success in adulthood. Whether you want to learn effective strategies for your therapy session or classroom, be an influential leader on your team, or find creative ways to use your skills to advance in your career, I've got you covered. everybody, it's Dr. Karen, and welcome to episode 185 of the DeFacto Leaders Podcast on the Bee Podcast Network. This episode will be a commentary on several of the episodes I did as part of the National Literacy Month Reading is Fundamental series. The Reading is Fundamental series was part of a partnership that the Bee Podcast Network did with Reading is Fundamental in September for National Literacy Month. Reading is Fundamental is a nonprofit that focuses on connecting educators and families with materials and training aligned with evidence-based literacy instruction. Not only is their model aligned with the science of reading, they also offer unique book ownership solutions for professionals and families to address book equity issues. You can learn more about Reading is Fundamental as well as the B Podcast Network in the show notes. What I did as part of this effort is I invited guests to in the month of September to speak on the topic of literacy. Now, I know this is something that I talk about frequently on this show, but I specifically focused on some certain topics that I thought were really important in addressing how we support students' reading, writing, and language skills, and did some extra episodes in the month of September. So in September, I published two episodes a week for a couple weeks, and I will be resuming my normal schedule of once a week in October. As part of this effort, I'm also giving my listeners the opportunity to join Language Therapy Advance or the School of Clinical Leadership and get 25% off their program tuition. So this is for either program, and it also applies if you want to join both programs. So that special offer is available between September 15th all the way through the end of October. I initially said September 15th through October 15th, but I have decided to extend that. So all you need to do to get that special rate is enter coupon code RIF25 on the checkout page when you join either the School of Clinical Leadership or Language Therapy Advanced Foundations. Language Therapy Advanced Foundations is my program that helps SLPs and other professionals supporting language to create a system for language therapy. You can learn more about Language Therapy Advanced Foundations at drkarenspeech.com backslash language therapy and the School of Clinical Leadership is my program that helps related service providers put executive functioning support in place on their school teams. So this addresses how to do direct intervention, as well as how you can collaborate with your teams to ensure that support is in place across your students' days. So we're addressing the therapy component as well as the programming component. To learn more about the School of Clinical Leadership, you can go to drkarendudekbrannon.com backslash clinical leadership. Again, to get that special rate, all you need to do is enter coupon code RIF25 on the checkout page. So you can still get that rate all the way through the end of October. And if you are a member of Language Therapy Advanced Foundations or the School of Clinical Leadership and you refer a friend, I will set you up with a $100 referral bonus. All you need to do to take advantage of that bonus is once your friend joins the program, have them email me at talktome at drkarenspeech.com and let me know that you referred them and I will set you up with that bonus. 
In this episode, I am giving commentary on three episodes from the National Literacy Month series. I will be talking about episode 180, The Relationship of Literacy and Language Skills and Involvement with the Justice System with Dr. Shamika Stewart, episode 181, Developmental Language Disorder, Impacts on Literacy and Life Beyond School with Dr. Carla McGregor, and episode 182, Leveraging Read Alouds to Build Language and Getting Started with Advocacy Work with Dr. Molly Ness. Be sure to check the show notes for links to the full episodes so that you can go back and listen to my full conversations with all three of these amazing guests. I'll start with key takeaway number one, and that is that when we are thinking about literacy, we have to think about language as well. So what I took away from my conversations with Dr. Stewart and Dr. McGregor is that literacy screenings and a focus on reading and writing can give us an opportunity to identify students who are in need of language therapy. However, this isn't the only entry point. So it's an important opportunity, but we can't just focus on reading and writing. We have to think about some of the other behaviors that present that might be indicative that a student needs to be screened and evaluated for language therapy services. Many times those students who need language therapy are going to be at risk for needing services related to reading and writing. So these things can be woven together, but at the same time, we have to make sure that we are getting the complete picture of a student's abilities. One thing that I talked about with Dr. Stewart is that many times, and this applies to reading, it also applies to language therapy, students are passed along and She gives an example of a student who was in the fourth grade who was showing all kinds of avoidance behaviors, who was labeled as a behavior problem, but when she evaluated him, she found out that he was reading at a kindergarten level, and he didn't have some of those basic literacy skills. He was also in need of language therapy. She also gave some examples of students that she's evaluated in secondary school who, again, were just kind of passed along, both in reading and in language. And they were presenting with all kinds of behaviors in the classroom because it was embarrassing for them. They couldn't read. And this is something that caused them a great amount of distress, thinking about how they are going to come across to their peers. And their coping mechanism is to engage in some of those avoidance behaviors or things that we would consider to be disruptive. And again, especially at the high school level, the consequence to that is is things that are punitive, things like detentions and suspensions. And while I would be in full agreement that students should understand the consequences of their actions, we should not be allowing behaviors that are not acceptable, that are going to cause students to have issues once they leave school or or even in their current lives. So it's not that we are excusing behaviors that are going to have a negative impact on other people like the teachers or the other students, but we have to make sure that the consequence of those behaviors is going to address the true issue. And if we have a student who is showing those behaviors because they can't read and write or because they are having language processing issues and maybe don't understand the directions, are overwhelmed with the language that they are having to process in their classrooms, then those students need services. Yes, there may be situations where it's appropriate for them to also have some type of a consequence that is in the disciplinary handbook, but we need to make sure that we're not just resorting to punishment. We can't punish kids into having reading and writing and language skills. We need to actually teach those skills. I would add when students are avoiding school or showing signs that appear to be related to anxiety, it is possibly true that students may have anxiety about certain situations and maybe they are in need of mental health services, but if they are having anxiety because they 
aren't able to read, we need to equip students with the skills in order to feel confident in those situations. And while I am a huge advocate for kids having safe places and adults that they can confide in, if they are struggling with something, talking about your feelings in a situation where you don't have the skills to be successful in that situation is not going to fully solve the problem. So we need to consider a holistic approach. Yes, students need access to the mental health support, and they also need access to services that are going to equip them with the skills for life and that are going to protect them from potentially harmful situations and allow them to advocate for themselves. Again, one of the conversations that I had with Dr. Stewart, for example, is that students are held accountable to disciplinary handbooks. I would say that when we get into employment situations, they're also going to be held accountable to their employee handbook. And when we think about the language in those handbooks, if the individual does not understand the complex syntax and vocabulary in those handbooks, we can't just say they know better, so they deserve a punishment. We have to make sure that they truly understand the vocabulary. And again, that is why, yes, it is a reading and writing issue because we have to be able to read documents like that in school and in life. And we also need to be able to process that language auditorily as well. So it's not just a reading issue. It is also a language issue. These things go together. One of the really interesting points that Dr. Carla McGregor pointed out, again, many of the things that I am discussing relating to my conversation with Dr. Stewart also came across in my conversation with Dr. McGregor, but Dr. McGregor shared a study where they looked at whether or not individuals with developmental language disorder could understand their Miranda rights. Again, in that situation, we are talking about having to listen to language auditorily when you are in a high pressure situation. And what the researchers found is that in a low pressure situation, so again, a safe space in a research environment, that those individuals could not understand the meaning behind the Miranda rights. So think about the implications for that. I think that a lot of people, when students get into secondary school, what we're saying is, well, students don't need that support in reading because we can simply have technology or individuals read things to them. Um, we It's about reading to learn, not learning to read, but if you do not have the language skills to process language, then you're not going to be able to fully benefit from those tools. And that's going to have significant implications in your life. An additional thing that I took away from my conversations with Dr. Stewart and Dr. McGregor would be the importance of conducting a full comprehensive evaluation and using accurate language. One of the things that Dr. McGregor pointed out is that there is nothing in the federal mandates that say we cannot use terms like dyslexia or developmental language disorder in the schools. So typically how that might play out is that yes, on the paperwork in the drop down box that you have to choose to designate the eligibility category, you might have something like specific learning disability or speech and language impairment, but in the paperwork, in your narrative documentation, and in your conversations with parents, you can say that your child is presenting with signs of developmental language disorder because that way parents and the professionals that are serving students in the schools know the characteristics, have more information about the kind of support that a student would need, and we are being as specific as possible. So there is nothing that says we cannot use these terms and that knowledge is going to be so important for families, for educators who are advocating for students to get those comprehensive supports. And this is so important in the early years, but there are huge gaps when we're thinking about students who are older, who maybe they did not get the support that they needed in their younger years and they've just fallen through the cracks or maybe they just need those comprehensive supports all the way through their school experience. 
So I'll shift for a second now and talk about my conversation with Dr. Molly Ness, because there is this conversation about what does literacy and language intervention and instruction look like across the K-12 years. And one of the important things that Dr. Ness brought up was that there are many things that we think of as activities that are done with younger kids, and read-alouds is one of those things. But actually, we can use this tool all the way through high school. We don't need to stop doing read-alouds with students just because they are older, and so this would be in the schools, and this would be at home as well when we're making recommendations about things that can be done outside of school to support language and literacy. So that is a a big takeaway that I took away with my conversation with Dr. Ness because she pointed out that doing things like think-alouds and read-alouds give educators and families a powerful tool for building those language skills and really helps bridge the gap between what we think of as the core content areas like reading and those other content areas that we shift into, especially in secondary school. And so read alouds and think alouds are tools that can really be used to kind of form this glue across all of those areas. And again, with think alouds, that is something that you can use along with read alouds. And it is a tool that educators and parents as well can use to model self-talk and dialogue that students can be doing while they're reading, while they are solving problems, so that we're modeling that internal dialogue that students can build when they're thinking about complex vocabulary. And so this is something that we can use in the content areas. It's something that teachers can use while they're teaching reading. Again, we also need to make sure that students have good instruction in decoding as well. But this is a way that we can ensure that we're addressing things like the vocabulary and the syntactic complexity that students need to be able to generalize those skills across settings. It's just one example of the how when we're thinking of how do we actually build these language skills? What do we do for those students who clearly need support in language and vocabulary, especially at the secondary level when we notice that students have fallen through the cracks. I will wrap up by talking about policy briefs. So Dr. Ness has a fantastic policy brief. I recommend that you listen to that interview. Again, that's episode 182 and check the show notes. She has a policy brief on book distribution and the impact. So This is something that is a tangible way if you have an initiative that you want to support and you want to spread awareness about something in particular that's going to have an impact on literacy, what you can do is create a policy brief. I know that advocacy work can seem kind of overwhelming. It can be kind of difficult to figure out how you can make a difference and what is a tangible thing that you can do. And policy briefs are a great way to get started. So we talk about that in our interview. What is a policy brief? How do you do it? And what is an example? So I recommend checking out Dr. Ness's website because she has her policy brief available and you can see what it is and how you might be able to get started. On the topic of advocacy, so there's a number of different advocacy initiatives that I talked about in these three interviews. So One of the examples, again, is book distribution, which is what Dr. Ness is doing. But some of the things that came out in my conversation with Dr. McGregor and Dr. Stewart, so I'll I'll talk about Dr. McGregor first. One of the things that she is wanting to promote is, again, using the language, developmental language disorder, and the importance of using that terminology, educating people about it, and really putting it on people's radars. I think that we've made a lot of progress with dyslexia and developmental language disorder has kind of come after that as far as being specific and really giving a clear understanding to parents and educators about what is this diagnosis, what are the characteristics, and how do we support students? So that is one other area where 
we can start to spread awareness on the policy end. And again, policy briefs are a great way to get started. A final needed advocacy initiative that came out with my conversation with Dr. Stewart, and I would say with my conversation with Dr. McGregor as well, is the need for language therapy in secondary school. Many times, speech pathologists and special ed teams are pressured to dismiss students from speech once they get to junior high or high school. Part of this is because of scheduling constraints. And in my situation, for example, I was not pressured to dismiss students from speech. But then when I actually got to the logistics, it was very difficult to get support and find time to actually provide therapy for students. So I would say that special ed teams, the the special ed teachers, the speech pathologists, we need support from administrators to be able to give students the interventions that they need. And it it's one thing to have something on an IEP. It's another thing to be able to actually deliver that IEP. And if we are going to all of the teachers and the teachers are saying, you can't pull students out for therapy during my class, well, obviously we want to be respectful of the teachers. We understand that what they do is important and we want to support it. But at the same time, same with what we do. And if students are showing behavior problems across the day because they don't have the language or the executive functioning to be successful in that classroom, and nobody is allowing us to provide the services that are going to address those problems, then we're not going to be able to help students and those issues are going to persist. So we need to think about restructuring the student's day and adjusting the caseloads of the intervention providers. And I would add the school psychologist, the social worker, and school counselors. And, you know, there's, I could, I could go on with that list, but I've talked to psychologists as well, for example, who are trying to do things like social skills groups, and they're not getting any support from the teachers or the administrators and actually having time with students or having time to collaborate with teachers and really getting out of that idea that you can actually effectively address language skills and executive functioning issues with a social skills group. If a psychologist or a social worker or a counselor is asked to address behavior issues and they're given a 20-minute social skills group and that's the model that they're expected to use, they're not going to get generalization. And, and this is a common challenge that I have, have heard really across all of those related service provider areas. So we need to be able to work with teachers to have administrative support in getting people to, to understand the importance of what we do, as well as the need to involve us in conversations about what's happening in classrooms. Because I would say that the siloing, you know, it, in my experience, it was a little bit easier at the elementary level because of the way that the schedule works. But with when it gets into high school, the, the siloing between classes gets it, it gets more more common. Um, it, it is more challenging to have a cohesive plan across the day when students are moving through classes. And I'm not saying we need to completely throw the baby out with the bathwater, but the intervention providers need the time to provide interventions. Therapy is not magic. I can't wave my magic wand and fix a language issue if no one is allowing me to pull students to do therapy. So I would say that this is an example of an area where a policy brief, a task force, or something is necessary. So the I'd say the three advocacy initiatives, again, that I've talked about are book distribution, importance of accurate terminology in special education evaluations, and advocacy for services to continue in high school. Addressing word decoding, continuing to understand that students need explicit intervention in reading, as well as language therapy in high school. We can't just say, oh, we're done doing that because this is what we do at high school. We have to address the core issues, which if students do not have the language and the reading and the writing skills to be successful, they might present as behavior problems and giving them suspensions and detentions is not going to solve the issue. We can't just say they know better because they might not. Um, I will I will wrap up now, but I highly recommend listening to all of those interviews. Again, 
episode 180, The Relationship of Literacy and Language Skills and Involvement with the Justice System with Dr. Shamika Stewart. Episode 181, Developmental Language Disorder Impacts on Literacy and Life Beyond School with Dr. Carla McGregor. Episode 182, Leveraging Read Alouds to Build Language and Getting Started with Advocacy Work with Dr. Molly Ness. And uh, check the show notes for all of those interviews. Take a look at the De Facto Leaders podcast feed at defactoleaders.com for all of the episodes in the month of September for the National Literacy Month series. We've got some amazing interviews. I have episode 176, Building the Language Skills for Reading, Writing, and Spelling with Dr. Jan Wazowitz, episode 177, Debunking Reading Myths and Defining Literacy Buzzwords with Anna Geiger, episode 178, Are We Allowed to Say Dyslexia in the Schools with Tom Pardon, and episode 179, Increasing Book Equity and Fostering a Love of Reading with Susan Brady. And that brings us to episode 180, which I've started discussing in this episode. So take a look at all those places, check the show notes for links to these interviews. And remember that until the end of October, you have the opportunity to get 25% off when you join either the School of Clinical Leadership or Language Therapy Advanced Foundations. Just enter coupon code RIF25 on the checkout page to get that special rate. And if you're a member of either program and you refer a friend, I will set you up with a $100 referral bonus. Email me at talktome at drkarenspeech.com for details on really any of those things if you've got questions about those, um, any of those special offers that we're running or if you'd like to collaborate with me in any way. I hope you've enjoyed this special series as well as my commentary on the series If you enjoyed this literacy series, please share it with your friends, especially if you want to spread the word about effective evidence-based instruction. Tell your friends about de facto leaders and leave me a rating or review wherever you listen to your podcasts, Apple, Spotify. That always helps me out and helps me get this information into the hands of people who need it. Thank you so much for listening. And I will see you next time.